Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of By the Numbers, brought to you by Alpha Draft, the fantasy uh, game website. I should have probably thought about how best to describe them in that introduction there. I am your host, Richard Lewis. Uh, with me, as always, is uh, the greatest analyst in the CSGO realm. It is, of course, Duncan Thorin Shields. How are you doing, my friend? Yeah, not too bad. We've survived another week. We're here still. Yeah. Yeah, mate. ESL's still we, fucking up. Nothing changes, really, mate. We're just ticking over, aren't we? So yeah, it's 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 the same old. Roll the free old. content, ESL. Keep keep it coming. <laughs> well, we're definitely going to talk about them at some point. Uh, in we the we are but the dogs who feed on the scraps from their table, Richard. That's the thing. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I guess we'll jump straight in. That tweet that they put out where they said, "If the same dogs uh, are barking, you're doing something right." Uh, was that aimed at you in particular, or do you I think assume it was me and Scoots because we both had, within like the last hour, said stuff about the drug testing, which they just revealed the news of. You know, that where they actually gave some details on the anti-doping stuff. Mm. Uh, my stuff was mainly just along the lines of like, oh, one of the main reasons I made my tweet actually was because Get Right himself was literally on Twitter having to ask people like, "Help! I have ulcerative colitis." Can I use this medication, you know, to keep me alive? And then yeah. obviously he's just going to potentially be wrecked if he doesn't know whether that's allowed or not. So I just made the point that, like, re are we really going like, to torture people like that on the basis of something you already said doesn't happen at your events, you know? Like, yeah. It has to be one or the other, right? Either it's happening well, loads and you need to crack down on, or it's not happening, but, in which case, why don't we fucking get right over yeah, but this is what I mean. So, like, I, I, I didn't even understand the logic. Like, it, it, let's just a look at that statement. That if, if the same dogs are barking all the fucking time, that just suggests you're antagonizing the dogs. You're not doing anything right at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, that, that's literally uh, all that's actually happening. Uh, I've just been told, I think we might be off air at the moment, actually. Okay. Yeah, okay, let's keep going. Good, good, good. Volume so, yeah, it was, just, it was just literally, like, what even is the fucking logic in that? That if you're going and just fucking basically say, hey, well, everyone's complaining about it again, so we must be doing it right. No, that's not, there's not even a way to arrive at that conclusion. So I, I, was, I was a little bit taken aback I mean, by that. Dogs are well known for their like sort of antagonistic circle jerk tendencies, which are actually like if something is right, they will all in unison claim it is wrong. I believe that's something known about the animal kingdom, you know? Dogs, yeah. very keen sense for being kind of hipsters yeah but here's the other thing as well like you know I, I, i'm pretty sure isn't dog a really derogatory term like is uh, you know isn't it uh dismissive and and, and really offensive in some uh, actually Richard, ones? i uh I, I this is actually my masterstroke trap because i actually had my korean girlfriend type that tweet so i believe <laughs> i've got you there esl mm -hmm. By the laws of men in Reddit, I believe I've got you there. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you fucking like win the round. It's like a scandal within a scandal. I've finally done it. But um, so anyway, we'll we'll get it in uh, ESL in a bit. Let's uh, let's start because we did say we weren't going to review it uh, too closely because uh, it was going on while uh, we were doing our show, and that was of course IEM Gamescom. Now, uh, it was a very interesting format not a traditional format so i think that's sort of a caveat that needs to be explained uh here with this the the, the way the way they did it wasn't a uh, standard to a tournament it was one of uh, carmack's ideas that he'd had for a while i think he might even have tried it in starcraft or he'd wanted to i think and... he just stole it from starcraft it's actually how in red bull used to have tournaments there for starcraft right. and they had one for dota as well it's the same system you have lives and you each nominate other teams to play he just took it from them basically yeah, yeah, sounds about right. Um, but anyway, so so it was, uh, you know, it, it was it was interesting to see it in a CS:GO context. I thought that had lots of uh, you know great potential. I'm glad that uh, we did something a bit different as well, especially just before a major. Having more of the same would have been a bit, you know, uh, a bit a bit boring, really. So they uh, they definitely uh, did a good job, but. What we, I really want to talk about is what happened at the event, uh, and that was you had uh, you know lots of surprises. Uh, I, well, I guess we'll start with the winners. Envious sort of beating TSM comprehensively. Uh, they took um, 
it was three maps actually, wasn't it, against them? Is that right? Just three in a row, yeah. I mean, yeah, they actually they took did. four overall because there was one earlier in the tournament, but the final was just a, a three hour, yeah. Yeah. So this was the TSM that actually we, we sort of had question marks about. You know, they were at the Ace of Predator Masters. We all know what happened there. They went out like seven to eight, rock bottom, uh, didn't win a series. Uh, and then we were like, well, do, do they have problems? But actually, over the course of Gamescom, they looked. Uh, pr pretty good, like more like their old selves anyway. Oh, yeah. But they came up against an envious side, and this is what I've talked about on this very show, and that is that, hands down, I, I thought envious were going to be unplayable well, now that they made this new roster. It isn't even necessarily that it was just an increase in quality, which is debatable. It's just that this just seems to be historically what happens with French teams. So, uh, obviously, you're a purveyor of the French scene. What did you make of envious's performances out in Germany? I mean, the one thing you have to say at the very beginning to kind of be fair to all the teams is to mention that the format isn't just like an asterisk, like, oh, it had this cool format. The format literally directly impacted every match potentially because for fans were literally voting the maps they wanted to be played. Therefore, whoever had more fans could potentially get the map that favored them directly. We weren't using a pick ban phase. Therefore, once you knew a team was really strong on a map, unlike most tournaments, you couldn't avoid it. Now, that might not sound like much to the average fan, but you have to realize during a tournament, if you're the better team and you have a wide map pool yourself, if you just realize someone's amazing on one map, it's default that you just ban it out. Oh, you just beat someone else on that? I'll take that away from you, you know. This isn't that, that oh, the better team should always win on it. No, every team's doing that. Even Fnatic at their peak, you know, was taking maps away from another team that they knew they were strong on. So you have to say that. Like, Envy has definitely benefited a little bit by having the maps in this particular sense and this weird form where people even got to decide who you played, etc., which is kind of strange. But taking all that into account, mm. they were absolutely unreal at this tournament. Like, yeah, yeah. they were so good, in fact, that it's one of those tournaments where I actually don't even believe they're this good in reality. Like, it reminds me of that first tournament, the one where TSM won that PGL that we did, the CCS, where they were just so above and beyond even Fnatic and wrecking everyone that, that you thought to yourself, like, this surely can't continue. And it didn't really, you know, future events they won were a lot closer. They give up more maps, you know, someone could potentially even beat them along the way. But this time around, Envious, yeah, just looked like by far the best team out of the tournament, despite the fact TSM was there. And as you mentioned, it's not like TSM was shit again, like at Predator. They were actually pretty good this time around. They looked they looked in good form. So I kind of feel like, to me, this is maybe like a bit of a tease. Like Envious have shown us the absolute peak level they can be at. I mean, I assume obviously they could improve a bit. But... I think that's more like a flash of what is possible. I don't think that's. I don't think they, there's any chance they're going to be at that level every time. Like they're not going to be at that level at the major. I don't think they can do it for a series. Maybe I don't think for the whole tournament though. Yeah, because put uh, it this way, if they did, they'd already be one of the best teams in the world by far. You know, they'd already, they, like they could they could instantly slot into like top four. They're that good. Yeah, but I mean, I, do do you not feel then that this this is the right time to sort of be in this devastating form with the major around the corner. I mean, isn't this... I know the tournament format's very different, but there's no getting away from the performance they've just put in against, uh, well, all of the teams uh, that they played at this event. Uh, w would you, on this evidence, be thinking, you know, Envious have got a very realistic chance of taking that major from nowhere? thing is, I don't think they really do, because actually I think it hurts them a little bit still that they haven't played that many tournaments. They've basically only played this tournament. So, okay, that's great. They got to win here, do a, show off a little bit. But in general, I think if you think of all the majors, one of the things I love about majors, it's the same reason why, in okay, so in a, I'll, I'll, as usual, draw a comparison to League of Legends, okay. One of the things I really don't like about LCS and League of Legends is that the whole regular split lasts about, Something like it's almost it's it's just a few weeks under three whole months in a row. Then you basically have the playoffs in like a reasonably short amount of time. You're gonna have a few playoff matches. The problem is in any sport, especially in esports, you do notice a drop off. People are really awesome in the regular season, then they drop off a bit in the playoffs, and then even if they're good in the playoffs regionally, in a big international tournament, they drop off a little bit more. And when they're playing the absolute best team in the world, they drop off a little bit more. It's like there really is like a ladder you have to climb, you know. And the best teams obviously can make it all the way up the rungs, but most people don't. They make it up a certain point and they drop out at some point in time so you might be good at one thing you might be good at another obviously the old way it used to be was online to land you know that was the, the old example of where you drop off a little bit so as a result i can't think of many examples in history where a team who hadn't been very good came into the major with sort of no experience in big tournaments and suddenly blitzed it and were like super awesome i guess there have been a few like flukes yeah. or one-offs like that but 
the problem is we're not really looking at this as like, oh, Envy's is going to fluke it. We're thinking like, are they going to be the best team basically? And yeah, listen, that's a possibility. I just wouldn't bet on it right now. Like I need, I definitely need to see a lot more, I think. Yeah. I mean, just to uh, pick up on that point, I mean, you famously were criticized for saying the Fnatic major win, uh, Dreamhack winter was, was, a, was a fluke, even though I, within the grand scheme of things, what they went on to achieve, that's a fair summary. Um, do, but they, they sort of came in from nowhere. I, I don't yeah. know. It was, it was NIP were meant to win. That was how history was. Or, or very games, one of those two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that, that, it, that like, was, it was, should have like been, like, as, in if, as in you could decide between the two who you thought was going to win. It was supposed to be like 100% lock, one of the two would win. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, is, is there not a chance that Envious could sort of be, be, you know, be that wild card? I mean, you know, I, I, I honestly remember from the source days, whenever a new French lineup got put together, they would be unplayable. Like, this is just what happens. And it, it seems the right time to do it. Uh, but any, any chance at all then? I mean, or, or just... Oh, I think there's a chance. Yeah, and just like, to add to that point, it's not even yeah, just okay. that they're going to be unplayable and super good. It just seems like all the other usual suspects you would bank to win have hit these sort of weird places. You know, we know or we know about NIP aren't going to be competitive uh, like they were. We know TSM are in a bit of a strange place tactically. It seems we know Fnatic clearly have some sort of internal issue that's maybe distracting them a little bit. We know Cloud Nine can get to a final but can't win a final. So everyone else that maybe is a contender actually is, is, is sort of struggling a little bit. No, I agree on that front. That's the interesting thing is that almost everyone else has some sort of, not if not black mark, at least a reason as to why there's like a downside to their form at the moment as well. Like anyone, even the ones that were rising, Navi then fell off and had got beaten up all those times by Virtus Pro. Virtus Pro won Sevo, but then they seem to have like shit event, good event, shit event. Like they have no consistency, you know. There's, there's actually no one right now who is like the favorite in the sense of like they definitely should win. Instead, yeah, there's a bigger pool. The thing is, since we only have the one event for Envious, like it is tempting to think they could win, but I'd still put a pretty low chance. Because I, yeah. I, the the big thing is we've only really like the problem with this event. It really, if you're being fair, is that there are only two teams at this event I actually particularly care about, which is oh, uh, three rather, which was Envious, the new lineup, Solo Mid, and Mouse Sports. The others I, I don't really care about. They're, they're just lesser teams, you know. They can argue amongst yourselves. So okay, Mouse Sports are not really considered like a, a someone who's going to win the major. They could do well. So really, all they did is beat TSM, and so. Yeah, this isn't like if this was a normal tournament, he had gotten to beat like two or three teams in big best of X series. I think you could say that a lot more confidently, you know, whereas this just looks, it looks like they had one amazing best of five final and some good play otherwise on the other days. Mm. Uh, what I'm going to do is, Duncan, uh, I've just been instructed by a lovely producer that we just need to queue to a short break. Um, so we're going to take a little break in the stream. If you're watching the VOD, obviously that's not going to affect you. If you're watching live intermittently because we're having technical problems, uh, we should be back very shortly. See you in a moment. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to uh, By the Numbers. Uh, again, if this is a VOD, that's going to seem really weird, but uh, we did have a few technical issues. Not our fault. Don't Can't say with any certainty it was a DDoS or anything. Looks to be a Twitch error, uh, but uh, the show must go on. So anyway, we're talking about IEM Gamescom. Uh, we've given assessment of just how good Envious are. Let's talk about the team they beat. Let's talk about TSM. I've got to say, they were hugely, uh, well, just hugely improved from the Ace of Predator Masters, where I actually thought to myself, well, th this could be a real problem for them. They didn't seem to have a lot of answers to wildcard teams, at least. But they actually had a pretty uh, you know, good run here and, of course, made it to the final before being comprehensively defeated uh, by Envious. Um, so the, the question is, what, did, what, what do you think about them? Do you think they've turned the corner? Yeah, I mean, actually, the, the, the weird thing is, it's one of those events where it just feels like they were underwhelming because of how it ended. Because they did just mm -hmm. get trounced three maps in a row by a team that, you know, we, we couldn't even have known could be this good. Like, it wasn't even on the cards that they'd be this good, especially because it's their first event, you know. Normally, you give people a pass on their first event. So, actually, when you think of how the event went, you have to realize it went like this. I think the very first game that was even played was the first Envious TSM, and that was the one where Envious beat them there. Yes. That was map yep. one. After that, TSM won every map against everyone. They won some of, like, 
like six or seven maps after that, like in a row against everyone. And not mm. like the same map every time, different maps here and there. Because actually what's happening was people, fans, were trying to give those underdog teams a chance to win, you know, by sometimes voting in a map that was good for them. TSM was still just handling everyone. So actually up until the final, I, w I was thinking, man, this is going to be a hell of a final. You know, TSM's looking really solid. Okay, Envy has beat him in the first map, but now they'll, they'll be kind of prepared for that. And obviously then Envy has kind of just popped that balloon and took all the air out of it. So it ended up looking crap. But I actually came away from this event feeling a bit better about TSM, actually. It was the Ace of Predator Masters that was the real shock. Because like I said on, on our last episode, when they finished last place at ESL ESEA Pro League, there was some weird con context to that. Like they basically lost one best of one to Keed and then mm. they lost to Fnatic. So that's not so bad. You only lost like half of your games to the unexpected team there. It's when they lost at Ace of Predator Masters and losing two best of threes and losing the teams that aren't even considered good. That's when it's a bit more shocking. This event, if anything, for me, kind of like settled, settled things down a bit and made you think, okay, who knows? Maybe Envious turns out to have some awesome matchup against them, but we don't know. But going into the major, I feel like TSM is back more where they should be. I'm not going to say they're like the super favorites or anything, but I feel like they are an elite team and, and they have figured some things out, I think. Mm. Um, you, any ideas about where you would be ranking them at the moment in your t in your top ten? I think I, I mean the actual the actual top ten won't have changed much because this like this events placings won't affect much because again because of the nature of it like fans are voting on maps and stuff I'm not going to like massively shoot people down so they're probably still third like I had them mm. third before I just, in the last rankings Navi just edged ahead of them partly because. Since I do exactly a three month span, it was right after where like two of TSM's first wins had just knocked off the three months. So it was just based on that. In terms of actual who I think's the best, I actually still kind of favor TSM to be like the second best team. I still think overall, like the amount of maps they're good on, the amount of teams they should be good against. It, weirdly, I think the only thing I'm worried about them is if they somehow mess up in group stage play. Like that's the only place I can see them having problems. I think if they get to bracket play, they're just too good a team over a best of three. They should win against most opponents. Mm. Uh, moving on, Renegades. I thought they were like one of the, they were the team that I was sort of most intrigued to see, and I made a point of. of although I didn't see every game at this event, I think I probably did watch uh, every Renegades game, uh, and there were there were lots of them. People obviously continually nominating them uh, to play because of the format of the tournament. Uh, they were they were obviously stretched to their limits. Um, but I, I thought they gave an incredible account of themselves. It didn't get off to a great start. Uh, they obviously got absolutely wrecked by Mouse Sports on Dust 2. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about Mouse Sports improvement on Dust 2 and, and why that's significant uh, in a moment. But also as well, they follow that up by getting wrecked by TSM. And you're like, okay, Renegade's going to have real problems. But uh, they then go in with wins uh, against SK Gaming. Uh, which they, they had to play three times, and they beat them twice. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, I think they ended on another defeat by TSM. So what, what we can sort of glean from this performance, for me at least, is that they are in that, they're solidly in that tier two now, that they are sort of knocking on the door. They can be competitive, and that there's, they've shown a lot of signs of improvement. Uh, for me, from where they were when we last saw them, back when they were still Vox Eminor. Uh, did they impress you? The problem is, before I actually talk about their performance, I have to point out that the only reason they finished third is because of this weird format and basically other teams having yeah. these weird alliances where they voted for someone else over someone else and all that sort of shit because basically Mouse Sports was better than them and better than them at yeah. this tournament yet finished one spot below. And you'll notice, even though they got to play, first of all, they did play SK Gaming like three times and they're in theory one of the worst teams at the event. You'll notice on day three, they didn't play a single game. Because basically yeah. they just got to sit back while everyone else nominated each other to try and fuck with each other out of the top teams, you know. So that was kind of a bit weird. So saying that, the problem with Renegades is I don't I just get the feeling like unless something crazy happens at this major, I think they kind of overhyped themselves by how well they did at that G Finity, where they got maps off big teams and we were like, wow, maybe this is just like a team from this region that we don't even know and they're really su su secretly super good and they've got this great edge on things. I think that's kind of died like, and this event helped it because the last few events have been a little underwhelming when they play top teams and you get smashed. But when they do play those teams who are more around sort of like the... 
let's say like the eighth spot to the twelfth spot. I think they're in there. They can play those teams. They could be around. They could be ranked around those teams. That's actually one of the weird things about this event. Actually, is that because of this bizarre format, they only played the really good teams or SK Gaming. Like I would have rather seen them play CLG in a bunch of games. That would have been interesting right there. If they can beat CLG, then that's telling me something more as well than just SK. You know, so yeah. I don't know. It's a bit half and half. Like I think they do have something going for them. They still can get better, but. I'm not convinced they can, like, I'm, here's the thing. They're one of those teams where I don't think they're an upset risk for elite level teams. Mm. Yeah, Sometimes I mean, you can I, be I, within a certain ranking, but you're not actually going to shock the top teams, you know? Yeah, I, 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 I sort of agree with that assessment. I definitely was going to make the point uh, that I thought Mouse Sports were comprehensively uh, the better team. And, and ultimately, had this been a standard tournament, would have finished above them. There's no doubt about that. I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, 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 they're, they're, oh, they've been... Uh, on another level to, to Renegades pretty much since their inception, actually, of this particular lineup. But um, overall, in, we know that Renegades are going to be, you know, playing out in the American scene. I, I can see them being like another keyed stars almost, you know, a kind of team that's going to have just a bit too much in the locker for the average NA teams, especially given that there's this big NA shuffle allegedly coming again. And there's going to be all sorts of chops and changes after the major. So I just think they're going to be sitting pretty. Uh, and I think in terms of domestically, what they're going to do in NA, I think they'll prove themselves to be a top team, get a shit ton of invites to events off the back of it. It's real smart, actually, to have them out there. But uh, I, I think overall, they, they, they did show that they're going to be competitive. They, they can't beat the likes of uh, a TSM. They can't beat the likes of an Envious right now. You know, they're not going to be... Uh, a top tier team for some time, but uh, I, they definitely earn my respect. I think they'll be competitive. Now they said on Twitter they feel they have to finish top eight in the major. They, they that that's the bare minimum that's acceptable for them. So is that a realistic goal? I mean, I I think looking at the teams that are at the major, they can achieve it. I I don't think they can do it. Actually, I would I would bet pretty heavily that they won't. Because here's the key thing that you have to realize. Okay, which is what I actually when okay I did a short video about the groups of the major. And the big problem you have to realize with the group scenario is I'm still not entirely sure. I've read a bunch of explanations as to how the redraw works, but the big problem with the redraw is that it can actually make you have groups that are even harder than you have now. So, for example, at the moment they're in the group that has Nip and TSM and CLG now. If that was a normal group, the way we used to play at the majors, I'd already say, well, I'm not going to get out there because even if Nip's not considered in great form, Nip should still beat Renegades in a best of one. Okay, So you'd say, okay, basically you have to hope you beat Nip there if you want to get out. But it's actually harder than that potentially because you have to realize with this redraw system, unless I'm totally off, <clears throat> since everyone gets redrawn in their groups, aside from the team that gets out in first, let's say in their group TSM does go out in first, okay? Well, now the problem if you're Renegades isn't you have to beat Nip once or twice or whatever. Now it's that you might get redrawn so you have the second best team from another group in. So that means you could literally go from having Nip in your group, first of all, to suddenly you've got Cloud9 in your group. Suddenly you've got Navi in your group. So with, with depending on the redraw system, it could suddenly get a lot harder. Now also, could they could lock out and they could get a, a matchup that's slightly easier, but there's not that many that are going to be that much easier when you consider that in terms of good teams, as we were kind of talking about in the envious part, suddenly the the, the kind of tier one that you're thinking of it seems to have swelled a lot more than it was three months ago, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like to say, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I, I know it's going to be tough uh, to finish in that top eight, but I just think... Uh, you know, they're a goals-orientated team. They always seem, uh, you know, d do really well. They're always competitive, even when they're playing teams that are significantly better than them. You know, that that, that anomaly, that 16-2 um, by Mouse Sports, I don't think you're going to see many games where they're that bad or get beasted that much, and definitely not by the major. They're going to boot camp, and I, I don't know. I, you know, I get your point. I, I could still see them sneaking in there. I, I think it would be a good outside bet, let's put it that way. But anyway, enough enough time on those guys. Let's talk about mouse sports. They for me are the big talking points at IEM Gamescom. Now I had a vivid memory of the Ace of Predator Masters, and obviously it wasn't getting accosted by Babam fans. Hehe, <laughs> kill him, kill him for pointing out that someone else in the scene is unprofessional. How unprofessional of it? Not those retards. Um, the 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 endearing memory of that event. Uh, was at the end when Mouse Sports had lost to Hellraisers, 
Everybody was outside in the uh, in the trademark red and white jackets. God be had them in the circle. Like even the fucking giant man that follows them around. Like literally, like something out of fucking Game of Thrones. That but he guy. is the he is the esports Hodor. Let's be yeah. real. And <laughs> well, he's, he can take that as an affectionate term if he wants. You know, Hodor was a hero. He was I, a good I was, man. I was thinking more like he's. He is just like the fucking giant that just follows the wildlings about, like yeah. But it's but more insulting could... to say hold on though. So yeah, yeah. Which is why I didn't I'm want to going do with it. that one, mate. His player name, his, his nickname is Psycho. He's oh, that okay. big and he's yeah. called Psycho. Fair, fair enough, then. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You might want to might want to revise that. We'll edit that out. We'll edit that out. Uh, but anyway, so even he was there listening to Gobby, like the movie maker was there. Gobby had him round in a circle, and he was like, "Look, you know." <clears throat> Only overheard bits of it, and uh, you know my German's not so great. Uh, but yeah, he was basically sort of reading the team, you know, the, the not the riot act, but saying like we we were better than this. We should have won that final. Um, and he kept them there for some time after the event, when everyone else was sort of getting drunk and and going off to the bar. Now, when I interviewed him at the Ace Predator Masters as well, he said he's gunning for the major. You know, German soil, German team. He believes it's their time that they can realistically do it. And I was watching their performances at IEM with real interest to see how they do. Now, the masterclass they put on against Renegades, sure, Renegades aren't tier one opposition, but you have to understand that neither are Hellraisers. And they got wrecked on Dust 2. They literally just couldn't hold short at all. That was all Hellraisers did, and they just couldn't do anything about it. They were just walking up short, picking people. Retakes on the site were sloppy. Mouse Sports were really struggling on that map. Yeah, here on, on Dust 2, they looked really, really good. And sure, they lost to TSM on Dust 2, one of TSM's strongest maps. They lost to Envious on Dust 2, one of their stronger maps. So, but overall, I think they were much improved on this map in particular, which had been a thorn in their side. Anyway, the take-home points for me were they had a really close game against Envious. Uh, they beat Envious, I think. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah they beat Envious on Train, which is rapidly becoming one of the, the maps that Mouth Sports. Again, you would probably say they're conceivably the best team in the world on that map right now. Um, they had, you know, some close games uh, throughout, and they just looked like a side that really could be contenders. I still think they're lacking just a little bit of firepower, but that that but ultimately, in terms of tactics and how well. They played that overtime on uh, cash they had against Envious. Just a great game and showed how close they can be when when things are going their way. So do, do you think Mouse Sports uh, are looking like, like an elite level team right now? Would you bump them up into that tier one? Once they have the, like, assuming they can play with the sort of form I've seen over these last three or so tournaments, you know, every tournament I've seen, they've gotten better. I think it's now four lands where they've shown me some some signs that are all good, you know. Occasional negatives, but in general, it's an overwhelming, it's getting better and better. The pitcher's getting brighter and brighter and looking sharper and everything's looking great. The thing with mouse sports is they're a great example of kind of like touching on what I'd said about Renegades. To me, the problem with mouse sports is they're a team where whenever they stabilize their rankings, say they've played six or seven events, say they get to something good, like they, hey, they could really get to like fifth or sixth best in the world. They could, they could be in that sort of realm. Unfortunately for me, they'll be one of those teams that's fifth or sixth, but they're not going to win the tournament, if you know what I mean. Like they're not, like to give you a different example, Hellraisers is unlikely to ever get into the top seven but Hellraisers will always have that really weird streak factor where they could be a much better team in a best of three. The thing about most sports is the things they're good at all make sense. It works from the, it works the same kind of way each time. The hierarchy makes a lot of sense. The stars make sense. The in-game leader makes sense. The style, the maps they play, everything makes sense. But as a result, you don't have a whole lot of variance, I don't think. So on certain maps, you know, they'll play a certain team competitively, whether they win, whether they lose, it'll be close. So I think they're the team where, they're, unfortunately, they're going to live like the heartbreak life. Like they'll make it to the round of eight of a major, or hey, maybe they have an amazing tournament and they make the semi-final. But then whoever they play there, some other really good team, they're going to lose like that heartbreaking third map, or they'll be close on two of the maps, but they'll lose anyway. I think that's kind of going to be their destiny. So I love watching them play, but kind of mm -hmm. to what you were saying about firepower, in the NBA, there's often a saying that people have for teams where they say like, oh, that team's one piece away from the championship. You know, yeah. like you need to make that one key roster move. Now, I don't know what that would be for mouse sports, and, they, and the lineup does work really well, but they do feel like they're sort of like 
either half a star or a star away from being at the level of, you know, the Navi, Fnatic, TSM. Th- those teams all have something more. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, it's, it's hard to put the finger on what the issue is. Like, I, I guess it, it comes down to, you know, look, God B is always going to be one of those in-game leaders. I don't think he's going to be a, a guy that can play like a happy and drop a bunch of frags. I don't think that's ever going to happen. He's clearly got better uh, recently, but he's still never going to be a, a potent threat. You can't criticize Chris J. You can't criticize Nex. So it really comes down to Spiddy and Dennis. Now, I always felt Dennis was the stronger player uh, of the two. I think performances reflect that. But what's really interesting is they seem to be in this, like, Kenny S. Apex world where neither of them can turn up at the same time. Like, Spiddy had a, a terrible day on, the, on the, the second day at the Ace of Predator Masters but turned up for the final. Simultaneously, Dennis drops off, inexplicably so. So I, I can't quite put my finger on why that is. Do you have any insight as to, to why that might be? Is it they sort of occupy this sort of similar space in, in the team and in, in the way they play? Or is it something to do with just, it, you know, individual mentality? Or Well, the weird thing about those two players is I never expected much from those players. I never even thought they were that great when they were in Penta. I didn't really pay much attention to them when I watched them play, you know. So actually, I was surprised that they've had so many good tournaments. Like at Sivo, they were playing way above their level. And that's part of the reason why Mouse was competitive to potentially get, well, make the final maybe. They didn't, actually. They made the semis. So to me, if anything, I think sometimes their good performances is just like, that's the anomaly. They're playing like above their level. Really, they should be among the worst players in their team. You know, that's a team where it's pretty defined. It really is like Kenny S Titan, where like, you know, the game is supposed to be Kenny S is a God every time that's next. Then, you know, it's supposed to be apex has to give us a pretty good performance. Two out of three games. That's Chris J. And then, you know, the in-game leader can't frag. There's existence, but he's brilliant strategically. Okay, there we go. God being the existence. I've got that. Then the problem is you've got those two sort of supportive type players who are occupying that role. Now, the th- thing is, they can do fine there, just like Maniac and RPK. Yeah, that's great. You can do fine there. The problem is, the big th- problem for mouse sports at the moment, I think, is that, yeah, you could replace one of those players, but would that then, like, fuck with how, what Nex and Chris J are doing? Would they have to move sports? Would they get things changed up? Because that might be a negative. There's also the fact that you really can't remove God B because he is, like, powering this whole approach, you know? As soon yeah, if he can't yeah. frag, he's a massive part of it. But the problem is, because he is so poor at fragging, it, to me, that puts more pressure on someone like Nex. Like, Nex really can drop 30 kills and lose the game. So he's almost entering Kenny S territory there, where that's not supposed to be the case for any elite-level team. So I think the problem with mouse spots at the moment is you have to ride it out and really... Like, I think in three months, you'll know if there's a weak point that you have to remove. But at the moment, it's hard to remove any of them because... Yeah, it's not working. Like, you're never going to be the best team, but it is in a weird way working. So you still have to kind of wait for something to break down, I think. Because I, I, I actually like... Listen, I still love to watch them when they lose. They're that sort of a team where it, it, they're just fun to watch. Mm. Um, so just some final thoughts about IEM. Uh, you know, did you enjoy the format? I, I, like I said, I'm actually a fan of this. I think it can work once a year uh, as, as a sort of novelty. Uh, and a bit of fun, and it's probably good to have it just before a major, actually. You don't give away too much tactically. You might end up playing teams where, or, or you know, on maps and in situations where ordinarily you won't. You know, you saw they had coaches swapping around and stuff. Like, it was just all a bit of fun. And this is actually probably refreshing for a lot of the players to regular tournament play. Uh, you definitely couldn't hammer this format. I think once a year is pretty much as far as you can go, maybe twice a year before it becomes a bit tired and, and needless. But uh, obviously, it's an ESL event, so I thought I'd better ask you. Yeah, I thought that, hey, I actually thought this, with the caveats of what you said there, that's exactly what I'm thinking. As long yeah. as it's like once a year, or it's just not meant to be like a prime part of the circuit. Like yeah. maybe you could have two in a year, and one could be by a different, maybe a different organizer does one for fun, you know. The thing is, it is a fun format because then it does what it manages to do that that esports doesn't normally have in the West is bring in this weird factor of like fans can directly influence the game. You can have these like admittedly some of them are fabricated, but like grudge matches and like alliances and stuff. What I actually like about that is we used they used to have that in Korean StarCraft where in the MSLs over there they used to literally let you pick 
your group partners basically and then the whole point is as you pick them you had to say on the mic like why are you picking this guy so you can just pick him and be like he's not good but usually you'd say something like you know oh, he beat me in this league three months ago and i'm gonna wreck him this you know it added a little bit of flavor on top of it it was a wwe type move you know so that is cool in its own way as long as it's not done too much i have to say as well a really good point that someone made on twitter actually was this is fun as like a novelty event anyway but it actually would be a really awesome novelty event if they had the same format but let's say it was like almost all the top teams there. Now, again, it'd be a fun event. But imagine if this was literally like Fnatic, Envious, TSM, Na'Vi, Virtus Pro, And then you could have like real rivalries. Like people who are just like, yeah, they fucked us over at the last final. So we're going to put them against the people who TSM who always beat them all the time. You know, whatever it would be, that, that would be a really cool way to even boost this format. I think if you could get those teams to go. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I got to say as well, it's a bit of a strange departure for IEMs because IEM has always been like the centerpiece. You know, you think back to 1.6 and IEM was a prestigious event. Is there not a, a risk that if they elect to keep this format, it sort of diminishes the IEM brand a little bit for Counter-Strike? Well, two things. One, that IEM brand has already been diminished for Counter-Strike, even within their own company. Like the major this year... And the major pro and the pro league this year, the two biggest tournaments that their company's hosting aren't IEM. Now the big problem with that is I don't have an issue. IEM can fade away if it wants. My problem is I don't know how ESL justifies that because if you remember, I don't know if they've changed this. Maybe they have. But if you remember, the tagline of IEM is like world's best gamers. Yeah. Well, this tournament was conceivably in no sense the best gamers in the world. Yeah, you did have TSM and Envious, but you also had SK Gaming. You also had renegades who were trying to prove themselves, you know. This, this was in no way a meeting of the elite level teams in the world who were all showing you the best play. And it's not even good. At the end of the year, because it's a fun tournament, I don't know anyone who'd even think this was like one of the top 10 events of the year, you know. There've been so many lands. So I agree with you on that point, actually. That is a downside of it. Now, it's not a downside to us. We get a cool yeah, tournament. Yeah. Who cares? It's, yeah. But, but you can't bill it as like, I am world's best game. That I, it almost seems pointless to do so anymore, except to get Intel's money. Mm. So if anything, uh, the only loser here was Intel. Sorry. Yeah, it, it's, it's possibly true. I mean, I, I guess to have a, a, a little bit of fun uh, now and then is great. But now that we've got sort of the IEM brand and ESL won there, I don't know, maybe maybe you sort of, to respect the history a bit more, maybe you would have a tournament format like this at ESL won rather than IEM. I know that's kind of difficult because IEM is Carmack's brainchild. It's his product. He's, he's in charge of it. He lives out in America now, you know, to, to, to have more of a hands-on approach to it. But um, with all of the history, I, I don't know, maybe it's a benefit somewhere else. But anyway, I, I do want to say bravo to, to ESL for trying out something new. Uh, we, we don't get a lot of that in Counter-Strike, actually. There's a lot of formulaic tournaments, and it does get a bit boring. One of the things that'll prevent uh, oversaturation, which, by the way, that's, that is going to happen, that's coming, uh, oversaturation of CSGO events impacting profoundly on the competitive scene is going to be having variety of events, different rules, different setups. So um, hopefully uh, th there is going to be a place for this, be it at IEM or otherwise. Now, talking about oversaturation and talking about events, there was a piece of news, uh, which is, it's almost like a non-story, but I think it's kind of interesting. So Valve uh, employee Eric Johnson uh, it was reported as uh, having basically sort of ruled out uh, a, a major, or sorry, an international uh, for CSGO uh, to go alongside the majors, similarly to what they've done in, in Dota. Um, now, he's hinted in the past, actually, that there will be an international of some sort for CSGO. Uh, if you go back to the previous international uh, in 2014, uh, he was quoted as saying... I don't know if it would be called the international, but the guys working on Counter-Strike made a lot of progress in supporting the professional community around that game. We all work at the same company and share a lot of ideas, and given how successful the international has become, I don't see any reason why a lot of the same things couldn't be applied directly to Counter-Strike. Now, we fast forward one year, same person, same company, being interviewed by IGN says... Um, I don't know that a CSGO International has to be coming. We're pretty comfortable with different projects, taking different approaches to solve similar problems. Uh, so what do you make of this? I mean, first of all, does CSGO need an International? 
Uh, I don't think it does actually. Like actually, I, I like the fact that it doesn't have an international, which will sound weird when I explain why. Because listen, I would be all for having majors and then maybe doing something like at the end of the year that leads into a grand final, which is like the champion of champions. Maybe the the top eight teams from all three of the majors somehow get mixed in there as the sixteen, you know, whatever order it'd be in. That that'd have its own flair to it. That that'd be cool in its own way. My problem is that the whole purpose, as far as I could tell, is so that at the end, whoever won it would be called, like in all these other games, the international, like World League of Legends World Championship, people would call them the best team in the world, which I don't like. Because essentially I don't think winning one tournament should ever make you the best team in the world alone. Now, if you win one tournament and you also win like two others and you place top four, yeah, now it's doing what it should do, contribute towards that. The big problem is one of the things I love about CS is essentially we've got the same system as tennis where you have all these different majors, but there's actually no rhyme or reason as to why anyone would call one major better than the other. It's entirely preference. And in fact, in tennis, no one calls the player who wins any of these four majors the best in the world. You are called the best in the world based on ranking, which is like overall performance in all tournaments, including majors. So I prefer that system. So that's maybe like a, a weird preference reason as to why I don't want international. I wouldn't mind it in another sense. I just don't really know that it's like, I don't know if the, the upsides outweigh the downsides when I just like, like to me, we sort of have three mini internationals. So I think that's cool. Just make them have more prize money. I think, I think we've got our own flair. Yeah. I mean, the thing is for me, right? Like, like <clears throat> On the one hand, uh, I totally believe that the CSGO community, uh, while this might surprise uh, them uh, if they are indeed one homogenous entity, which of course they're not, but I actually want to uh, say I think they've supported their game admirably, and I think they would definitely rise to the challenge uh, of, of um, matching anything the Dota community could do, even in reduced numbers perhaps. I'd like to see an event that almost is a centerpiece of the season, one event we could say, well, that's the big one. Um, you know, an equivalent of Worlds in League or the International in Dota. Just one tournament that's comparable to a Super Bowl or just something. I think that'd be good. But that said, I think what's super harmful is if it's so much bigger than everything else. This has always been my gripe with the International. That it's too, for me, it's too big. It's too much money. It's too ridiculously life-changing. It almost obfuscates everything else. Like the mainstream media come in and they talk about that. And they're like, oh, international, look, they're making millions and all that. They don't care about the regular uh, scene. They don't care about the time they made, you know, three quarters of a million, right? And, and all these other great things that are going on. Nobody cares about that. It's like, oh, it's the international. And it's become this almost ludicrously over-the-top um, centerpiece to a season. Yes, it's the biggest thing in esports, no doubt about it, just in terms of prize money alone. Everyone wants to be a part of it, even if you're not a Dota fan, it seems. Um, I wouldn't want anything that big and gaudy in CSGO. I don't think it would be appropriate. I'd like to see, actually, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, a, an opportunity to have like a big event and maybe we expand to one more major and have it like how they're doing it uh, at, at the moment, which is we, we have majors, which are key points of the season, and then bang, we have a big one at the end of the year or whatever, close it out, you know, and, the, and then the season starts anew. Um, that's literally so, what Dota's going to do, Barry, yeah, by the way. Yeah, exactly. But, but again, like what's funny is that's the thing. People always contrasted CSGO to Dota, but actually it's the other <laughs> way around. Dota wants to move more to CSGO for this reason you're mentioning. Exactly. Just exactly. that they don't just want the one event, they want the one event and the others. But yeah, like but Valve backed, so they're known as that, yeah. But the problem you've got there is, I mean, first of all, apart from, you know, let's not even get into the debate about, well, the International got DDoSed, you know, it's fairly embarrassing. Valve handled that uh, themselves. Um, you know, that's, that's a side issue. But Valve obviously want to run these events directly. Now, do they have the infrastructure uh, and know-how and expertise and staff to be able to do that? To, to run their majors. So literally they would bring in a production team. It wouldn't be like ESL one is a major and you get the boxes. It would be, this is the North American major by valve and it would be produced by ESL or ESEA or DreamHack. That's how it's going to be in Dota. So, um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think we need to be very careful what we wish for here. I'm pretty sure if valve could go back and do it the way they're changing it to from the start, they would. I don't think they could have anticipated the success of the international. That's the great thing about Valve. They're wildly experimental. They don't, uh, they don't necessarily care uh, about 
Um, you know, like, let's take a risk. Let's see what happens. And the international was a ridiculous success, a runaway success. But now it eclipses everything else. That's the problem. It's been too successful almost. So I, I, I think we need to be very careful what we wish for. Like, I'd like to see maybe a cap, you know, or something like that. But we, I think we should definitely have a bigger, at least one event that has a distinctly bigger prize fund. Like, I know it's ridiculous considering, you know, a quarter of a million dollars. It's a huge amount. And we were, we were crying out for this not that long yeah, ago. Yeah. But now it, it's almost a bit passe. You know, the majors are doing it. ESL can fund their own quarter of a million tournaments now. It's just, you know, meh. It's almost, well, you I know. Did, I, I obviously didn't mention this, but I definitely am in favor, obviously, of crowdfunding. I think that's great. Yeah. I think that really should be done. In fact, that in its own way, if you give people the choice, maybe that maybe they can make the choice for us. Maybe you still have the three majors and your international type tournament, and the three majors still have great funds like they have now, but then the fans decide that they want the international for CSGO to be the one that's the five million one, you know. Cool. I mean, I wouldn't complain about that. That's that's kind of like people have decided there, so I don't mind that actually. Maybe that maybe that's a way to take care of things. Um, I I hope so. And just obviously as well, I'd like to see something from CS:GO that gets a similar level of attention as the international. Um, you know, from the mainstream media. <clears throat> now, CS is always going to be problematic uh, in terms of how you broadcast it and how the mainstream media touch it. It's about guns. It's about terrorists. It's <clears throat> not going to play well with the American media. But that said, um, I, for me, and I, I, I've said this throughout, Counter-Strike for me is the ultimate uh, team sport in eSports. That's not to be disrespectful to anyone else's game. Just for me, that's what I believe. And I don't think it gets the same amount of attention as League or, or Dota because it doesn't have this point of entry. If, if it had that point of entry where the mainstream media could point at something, like they did recently with the fucking doping scandal, if they had that point of entry, a way they could frame it to the regular users, then I, I think we would, it would get the attention that it deserves. And I think once that happened, it would continue to grow. Um, so yeah, I, I'd like to see something akin to it. Uh, it was interesting, actually. This ties into a tweet from our colleague, Scoot. He tweeted... CS dollars in 2006 was 1.616 million from 54 events. And then he said CS dollars in 2014 is 1.923 million from 147 events. So linking that to what we're talking about here, Dunk, is this, uh, is this, a, is this a problem? Are, uh, is, is prize money actually comp you know, below where it should be? given how much bigger CSGO is compared to how big CS was in 2006? I don't think that's actually even disputable. Like, I think, I think I've never seen anyone give a compelling reason as to why prize money is where it should be and it shouldn't grow. Like, all I've seen is, for example, the reply to that tweet from the ESL guy was like, well, 2006 was when CS hit its peak, whereas, you know, CSGO is only a couple of years into it. It's like, that, that's not anything, mate. Uh, like, all you've done there is make a weird correlation that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You haven't explained what the reason that made CSGO become peak in 2006. Therefore, what would happen in CSGO, you know? What you basically said there was, like, ah, oh, well, uh, in 2006, uh, Heaton won a championship, and that was uh, six years into the game. So I guess six years into CSGO, maybe Heaton will win a championship. But we can't really say whether he will or not. You know, we have to wait six years. Like, no, there's no correlation there. You know, so I, I, while I can acknowledge on one hand that probably was like you know, off the top of my head, I think that was like the most competitive year of CS 1.6, and in terms of tournaments, it was the one that had the most. There's also the fact that that beyond the majors which did exist in 2014 the rest of the tournament circuit hadn't quite cycled up to where it is now where now i mean for example this iem games tournament was like 45k first place we just had a gfinity which in a esl system is a tier two event that was a 40k first place so there's no, no the prize money now is rolling in this year compared yeah. to last but i do think that it is indicative of the fact because obviously the main thing you're looking at there is that the majors should be the thing absolutely pumping the purse up and the majors themselves haven't moved on despite the fact we're about to have like the what is it now be like the sixth one or something mm. let me think yeah the, the sixth one now and it was still at the exact same number as before and as someone always, always mentions but i know it's the esl guy never talks about and valve never talk about where are the new cases 
Yeah. This is literally, you've got a license to print money. Where are brand new cases to get people to buy more? Where are the numbers on what the cases, you know, all these things, they're always so, it's just quite poorly handled. Mm. Yeah, so what do you think's gone on there then? I don't get it because it's literally a license to print money and they're not doing it. Same with the crowdfunding thing. Here's the thing that I will never get about this argument. People set this debate up over crowdfunding for like an international NCS in such a way that makes no sense. So they say stuff like, well, what do you expect? Of course, Valve doesn't raise the prize money. You know, they want to make a lot of money. Are you an idiot? They would make four times more than they've ever made off anything in CSGO off one international because you have to remember, you know, in the international, they raised $20 million. No, they didn't raise $20 million. They raised somewhere like $60 million. Valve took $40 million, shoveled it into their fucking pocket, and then put the tournament on. Think about how much Delta 2 costs to make and run and staff. I'll tell you right now, it's not going to be anywhere even near $10 million over the whole history. Every time they do an international, they're going to be making like fucking movie blockbuster numbers into their pockets for doing a, next to nothing compared to the cost, you know. So actually, Valve, if they really care about money, should be doing this all the time. They should they should be the ones pushing for international, pushing for more cases, pushing for more. I, I assume it's just incompetence, like like they don't pay enough attention or they haven't got a dedicated staff of people working on it. Like I know people say that that's not true anymore, by the way, that whole myth about like, oh, everyone at Valve's sort of like a hippie thing, you know, man. Like you got to like go where your heart tells you that day. And that's what you do. I, I, apparently that's like some shit that might have existed five years ago, but doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But come on, man, with how much money they've made now, there should be a dedicated team who only work on CS who, and then a team of people who only know about esports of CS. And these people should be the ones telling us this stuff. Like, this is why we're going to do this. Here's what we're going to do in six months. Here's what's going to go on. So I, I, I can only assume incompetence, unfortunately. Yeah, I've, I've, I've talked about this. I, I, I said that I think what, what Valve need to do is they need to have it. Like, I, I'm pretty, they do have a dedicated team. Uh, for CSGO, but obviously they still swap people around. That's just the Valve way. I think there's still a little bit of that going on. I think the most important thing they need is somebody, like I say, that's outward facing, a community manager, maybe a commissioner for the majors as well. Add a bit of structure, add some channels of communication, add somebody that we know that if, if there's something they need to know, instead of tweeting at fucking CSGO dev or whatever about, you know, this is broken. Or, we need... We, we need a direct channel of communication. Like, and this is, the, this is the sad thing, actually. People probably don't remember this far back. The game's completely changed since then. But at the start, there was a lot of encouraging signs, actually, that we were going to have open channels of communication with Valve. They flew all the players to Seattle, the casters to Seattle, um, in that sort of meeting that was meant to be secret. I remember breaking that. Then, on top of that, uh, all the subsequent events, after when CSGO came out, Valve... The, the Valve team were there and they were asking players about, you know, do you want to record this video for this? And, and, and what do you think of the patch at the moment? And how can we improve? And, and I know, I think you've been in one Valve meeting uh, as well. Uh, at, uh, was it a dream hack? Yeah, I lost dream hack. Yeah. Uh, I think you went ham over something. I, I didn't get to go to it. What was it? Oh, it was it about was the, band, the cheating the shit. Cheating bands. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there you go. So I, I, I did hear that you went fucking crazy in that one. Um, crazy in a good way, Duncan, obviously. Uh, not crazy in a bad way. You never do that. But um, the bottom line is that really seems to have sort of petered out. You know, the pro, the, 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 the pro forums, that they're, they're not there anymore. They're not being utilized. There isn't a point of reference. I don't see the Valve guys. Uh, at the events um, with the same sort of density. I mean, I had a great time talking to them in the SL1 Cologne. Uh, they were super, you know, that, that's that, that's how recent the sort of change seems to be. So that suggests to me that either they're gearing up uh, to something or like you say, maybe they're a bit overstretched. Maybe they don't realize how important it could be. But there's got to be something, I think. We've got, we got to change something here if you want to really, if you want to see this scene reach its full potential. The problem is, it reminds me of, uh, to, to again draw back to League of Legends. Mm. In League of Legends, even to this day in 2015, if you bring up a problem that Riot isn't fixing this or they haven't done this that they promised, someone will always come along and go, listen, you have to understand, Riot only started a few years ago. They were this plucky startup company. And every time I just want to grab that guy and go, 
That was six years ago or something, mate. They now have thousands of employees, make yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars a year, have untold resources beyond every other company, and have been working on their own game for like six years. None yeah. of those excuses hold water anymore. So it has to be the same for Valve, I'm afraid. You li like, it's one thing if you were only making 10K a year profit, and then people are asking all this stuff, you do this, do that, do that. Oh, we can't justify that. There's, it's the opposite. You can't justify not doing this stuff, mate. You're making millions and millions of dollars. Mm. I mean, people don't get it. The amount of money someone like Valve makes off CSGO is more than like anyone in history's made off a purely esports title, you know. Like I'm sure, oh, okay, World of Warcraft might have made more. But any esports title, any of the puzzles in it, the old Counter-Strike, Quake, StarCraft 2, there's no way they've made as much here because they didn't have all this extra shit you could buy. So I'd, I, I think at this point the excuses don't work anymore. Like I could handle them for the first year, the year and a half, because we only just got the majors. Like at that point, we're just glad for any attention, you know. But now it's getting to the point where it's not, you, put it this way, you're not being rude when you now demand more because at the end of the day it's at the point where now it's justified you know mm. yeah I, I i i agree um i i just think uh that something's got to be in the pipeline like valve have got to be announcing something soon like so there's got to be something that's gonna give everyone that excitement factor back you know the last thing you want to do since you brought riot to the table is like you say, Riot have consistently put out the same excuse over and over and over again. And even as people have become more and more disgruntled with the game, same excuses, same standpoint, same lack of transparency, same lack of honesty. Now it's got to almost like a critical mass where very rarely do you read uh, League of Legends fans saying anything good about Riot or their game. I mean, apart from the usual, let us all just imagine what it was like to work for Riot and read something bad, you know, like... The childish shit, like as if critique isn't allowed. Now, I think we're at the first stage of the rumblings uh, of disquiet. Uh, you know, I, 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 I genuinely think so. And, and the community, they see something like the International. They get a little bit antsy about it. They, they see other organizations like ESL now being able to match a major pound for pound out of their own pocket. They are a little bit unhappy with game balance and th th there seems to be no communication about what's coming. You know, what player signature stickers, can we have them? Can we not? Where are the new esports boxes you talked about? These are the rumblings. This is where Valve need to jump in and say, look, guys, totally appreciate what you're saying. Honestly, we are working on the game. We've got something super cool coming. Can't give away too much. And that's all you need to say. And then the community's like, oh, okay, Valve have heard us. That's good. If they leave it too long, you, you end up in riot territory where you're just literally getting wrecked. Like what I don't get at the moment, at the, at the moment, if we're being honest, the community spokesperson for ESL, for, uh, for Valve is ESL. ESL are the ones who always come out and say, this is why, they, you know, can everyone just be careful? Like, you know, Valve's doing so much for pros. They always fly them out and stuff. The problem with that is I can't tell whether it's really bad PR or really good PR. Because on one hand, yeah. a bit like the right example, I think some people do believe it. So in that sense, maybe it does allay people's concerns. The problem is every time I read it, it just makes it look worse because they mess up the PR and they say stupid arguments like that. Like, you know, oh, Valve does do a lot for it. It's like, well, that's not how anyone's debating, are they? No one's saying, fuck Valve. They're saying you, you should be doing more. You know, it's that's that's my problem is that they, I, I don't mind someone making a decision. I don't mind. I just want to know why they make that decision, you know. Then, then I can accept it or I can say, okay, well, nothing I can do about that. It's when they're just silent completely. If you're just totally yeah. silent and you're doing yeah. weird fucked up decisions, what do you expect? We're going to have to speculate, aren't we? We've got nothing yeah. else to go on. Yeah, ex exa exactly right. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think something's coming. I do think something's going to come, but I think Valve need to act soon. I think they need to give something to the community at this juncture for us to get excited about again. Uh, just, just something, anything. And it, it's long overdue appointing a community manager or, or, or someone that can sort of be a point of uh, contact or communicate complex decisions or update us on things that are happening behind the scenes. Anyway, while we're talking about people communicating with the community, we had uh, ESL, their press liaison officer, um, their sort of, I don't even know what her official title is, head of, head of media, I, I don't know. But anyway, Anna uh, went on to the subreddit for CSGO and posted about their doping policy, the anti-doping policy, uh, and what it would mean. And she answered, obviously, the big questions. 
uh, like what substances will I be testing for, how will the test take place, blah, blah, blah. So just to give you a, a summary, and I, I know obviously you've read this, but just to give everyone a summary, uh, they're going to test for all the substances on the WADA ban list, which include recreational drugs, anabolic steroids, you name it. Uh, even some cold remedies would be would would flag you as positive. Um, they're going to do testing via saliva, so it's not going to be sweat, which is uh, the, the the skin tests were being talked about. They're the least intrusive, but they're also the ones most likely to be tainted and be inaccurate. They're, they're going to do saliva testing, which I, I'd say that's a little bit intrusive. Obviously, if you use that for capturing DNA and stuff, uh, you know, and it, it can't be cheated like urine tests can. That's another reason for, for why it's there. It generally gives a better result. They've said they're going to do randomized testing, which is if you win uh, the tournament, even you're not guaranteed to be automatically tested, which is like a standard in some athletics and stuff. Like the the leader, the, the winner has to lead by example and and, and give give his sample, uh, and they've they've clarified that if you've got a legitimate prescription for medication, it needs to be disclosed in advance to ESL, which is a little bit less uh, egregious as what happens with WADA. Usually, what you have to do there is you have to get a doctor's note and uh, a special exemption from 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 uh, testing and, and all of that shit. And finally, the big one, they will be prohibiting the usage of marijuana. The old blaze it that I know you're so fond of, Duncan. The fact they even put that as their own section is like, are you this out of touch, guys? Like, and finally, the devil's cabin. Like, I, you already just said recreational drugs, you fucking downer. Like, are you kidding me right now? It's not 1920, and I, and I wasn't under the influence, in, under the... Expectation that like CS GoPros might go out and rape white women on the basis that they're that high. Yeah, oh, yeah. On, on this, Mate, infect your mind with that reefer and jazz music, and uh, you know, just yeah. So anyway, uh, they they did clarify that marijuana is on the list of prohibited substances, and that means that use of it be during the event and obviously before, so it would flag up, will be prohibited and will be punished. Um, We'll get into punishment in a little bit, but give me your thoughts about this madness. The problem is, before I get into any details, I can never get on board with this because of their own stance that they stated, which I also kind of go along with, which is that there isn't enough of it going on at events for it to be a concern where you should have... To, it's the same as fucking terrorism on planes, mate. I'm sorry, there is not enough evidence to show that that many people are trying to do terrorism through the methods you're actually trying to detect when you go into a plane with all those TSA searches to make it worthwhile for all of us to have the inconvenience and sometimes not even inconvenience, like the indignity of being like fucking cavity searched and all sorts of shit, having ray beams shot through our body, stuff that like it would only be justifiable if it was really, really important that you did it okay. So I don't know almost anyone who agrees with most of the sort of TSA stuff in, in that thing. So in the same sense, I don't think that pros should be put through all of this when we've yet to get any kind of numbers to show that there is a big enough problem going on here. Mm. And here's the ultimate irony of it all. So they're going to stop people smoking weed. They're going to stop people taking certain painkiller medications, etc. Yet they're essentially admitting that you can probably fucking take Adderall if you have the doctor's exemption, which was the first drug you wanted to get rid of. Is this real life right now? So the only drug you will be allowed to do is the one you were fucking trying to catch. Bravo, fucking bravo. You, you, this is like one of those things like scientists baffled by companies' ability to fuck everything up. <laughs> like, it's unreal, isn't it? How do they manage it, Rich? How do they well, manage it? Let, 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 let's, let's be even clearer here. Like, I've said this a bunch of times. There wasn't even a problem. Drugs and esports wasn't a problem. It just wasn't. Has anyone ever come up to you, Duncan, ever, and said, got to do something about all these drugs and esports, man? Anyone ever said that? No. Put it this no. way. Think about this. Think about how the world works in esports. Every secret behind the scenes in Counter-Strike comes out. 
idiots say shit on their streams all the time. People leak stuff. I mean, people leak stuff to you so you can write stories about it. Yeah. How is it possible that, let's face it, unless every pro was on drugs, so not a single pro has ever just thought, you know what, I'm actually quite salty that I just lost that spot in the semi of the major. And I know that other guy who was really good was on Adderall and so he was even better. Why has no one ever leaked it to you? Like, oh, they were all on Adderall anyway. Why has that never been leaked? How is yeah, that well, one secret? Well, it, what, I, I, is this the I, Illuminati? How has it stayed amongst everyone? I, I, as, as I said, the, the reality is it's almost like it's so blasé. Like, people just don't give a fuck. No one's ever thought, oh, I'll fuck them over because I know they're on Adderall. Because the presumption a lot of the time is, yeah, everyone's, everyone's at something. Everyone's doing something. Like, the amount of, especially in the NA scene, like I say, I mean, in Europe, it's still a relatively recent phenomenon. But again, it's like in Korea uh, with with StarCraft. You know, the amount of pros that are doing beta blockers before stage games, surprisingly high, let's put it that way. Now, nobody's going to say anything because maybe one day they want to do it or or maybe they, you know, what would happen? Who's going to test them? Who cares a, a lot of the time? You know, Let's be clear. I can't think of an example where the team I've known have been taking something have won that tournament. They're not one in my brain. It's like winners. It's like the old 80s phrase, you know, winners don't use drugs. I mean, literally, that's correct in esports. Never seen it. Uh, can't think of one example. But certainly people are doing it. I've never talked about it because I, I don't give a fuck. I, don't, I literally don't think it's important. I don't think it's a big deal. I, I don't think... Anybody, plus we, we don't even, we haven't even measured what the drugs do, like in esports terms. Yes, if you do fucking steroids, you can lift heavier weights or run faster or, you know, whatever it is. If you keep working out, you'll get the improvement in muscle size and everything else. But in esports, muscle mass, is it an advantage or a disadvantage? Do we know? Oh, any by the way, that, that would be a great way for ESL, to me at least, to do some good work in this area. Before doing drug testing, fund a study where you actually have people who have licenses to use Adderall, show them using Adderall to do uh, play games, see what the differences are, reaction time in terms of yep. how they tend to do, and then have people who already take Adderall admittedly, but don't have a proper license for it, have them do it, have a control group, or do all this shit. And then if you've actually found something at the end, you know what, then you can at least say to me when I say this is unnecessary, oh, well, I've actually got some stats here and here's a study that I've got some proof of. And the moment you've got no proof whatsoever. I mean, you're telling me this Anna person or someone at ESL is an expert on what Adderall does to people who aren't, who don't need Adderall prescribed for them. I don't think so somehow. I don't think they did that on along, as, I don't think they were moonlighting as fucking biochemists as well as fucking up all these CS tournaments and not knowing how to put together a press release. But here's the other thing, okay. Another issue that is really disturbing to me is this issue of the fact that if you are already on a medication, which isn't performance enhancing, but because these drug things ban so many things that aren't performance enhancing, you it's up to you to now disclose that. And by the way, where does it say the thing about exclude? I'm just trying to check if, what the specific wording was. Let me see what the disclose part was. Okay, here we go. Mm. It says... Like what happens if a player has a legitimate prescription for medication? I mean, they put such as Adderall, but I'm going to think of like medication that like is maybe life threatening. Like you have some sort of liver failure problems. I don't know what it could be, you know, something really important that you take this medication. Now, obviously they're not going to ban someone doing that because like no one wants to PR of like player dies due to some sort of problem because he couldn't have his medicine. So they put this, here's the wording. This is the ESL person saying this. In this case, they have to disclose this to us as soon as possible. Now, write that there. I'm immediately disturbed by that. If it said they have to disclose this privately to WADA or whoever it is that they're getting to do it, and we ourselves, you know, to keep people's confidentiality, we won't know what's going on there. They just tell us whether someone's banned or not. And if there's an appeal that has to go through its own separate court system. No, no, they're saying you have to tell people whose only job is to fucking close the doors, put up scaffolding, turn on some PCs and let you play some games and know nothing about drugs, you have to tell that person what is wrong with you. You have to tell them if you have some threatening illness, if you have some embarrassing illness that yeah. maybe people would fuck with you. And you have to now trust that that will never get out from ESL. Again, who, as I've mentioned, they aren't doctors. They don't have any doctor confidentiality thing. They can do what the fuck they want. They can come out tomorrow and say, oh, he, yeah, he actually has AIDS. And then you're just yeah. fucked for the rest of your life. That's actually really w worrying to me. And the fact that not, someone like ESL hasn't thought that through is really worrying to me. Because like, like I even said, there's an obvious fix to that, which is have it that it goes privately disclosed to the VADA people. And if they they think it's fine, then they tell ESL, yeah, he's cleared. He can, he can go through. Mm. I mean, look, I, I've said this as well 
uh, the the ridiculousness of you know but having to get players disclose stuff to it to an organization I mean there's a reason why this can happen in you know the mainstream sports that's because everything about it is pretty much watertight and you've got legal protection so if anything was to leak out you know let's say for example if you were a premier league footballer and you had hepatitis and you didn't want anyone to know for obvious reasons could affect your sponsorships you know could, could affect perceptions about you affect the way you're treated on the pitch by other players you uh, and ultimately, what teams would sign you as a result of all of those things could really have a serious detrimental impact on your career. You would have a le legal recourse if that was ever leaked. The the the, the uh, person responsible for the leak, the organisation responsible for the leak, you would fuck them in a court. You would get a massive payout because you get all the potential loss of earnings. All you would need to be able to do is ably demonstrate it and impact it on your career. Now we've got nothing like that in esports. Nothing. Like the, a, a player, like you say, it could be, you know, statistically, there probably is somebody in esports that's HIV positive, right? It's could not be. my fuck. It, it's not my. It's none of my fucking business who it is. You know, people might say, "Oh, Richard Lewis, you know, the journalist." I'd never fucking publish that fucking story. Never. People don't have a right to know your fucking private medical history, unless, as I said, you know, if you if you then do something fucking crazy with it. Yeah, like if you're trying to infect other people, then it's a public interest story, yes, obviously. But just as a rule, no no one's fucking business. N definitely not in esports. There's just no need to know about it. Now, we've seen all the time, as you rightly said, shit like this gets leaked out. Shit gets leaked all the time. There is nothing cast iron, nothing watertight. And here's the other thing as well. It it's not going to take long in a testing environment for somebody to go, well, why doesn't he have to do one? People are going to ask questions. And then it's almost like by omission, there's an implication. Oh, what's wrong with him? Yeah. So it just creates this awful climate that I, I, I'm, I'm definitely not comfortable with at all. I, I, I wouldn't trust ESL with medical information. I'm sorry. You know, I've got a lot of respect for the professionals over there. But I just, I, I, I just don't want that. I, I, don't, I don't want that even being part of our discourse in esports. I just don't like it. It just feels fucked up. It's so wrong. And it, with, with, when players have no legal recourse, no protection, like there's no, there's no player union. That, you know, that, what, here's what would happen, actually. If a player did get outed as having uh, a, a disease that had a stigma attached to it, the organization, which right now, the managers are the only fucking line of defense for players, which is hilarious, by the way, given how managers make their money, that manager would come out and kick that player. Just, just wouldn't be worth a headache, would it? You know, oh, our sponsors don't like it. So you're gone. Sorry, mate. And they'd, they'd fudge it up as well. They'd hush it up and they'd say, oh, he, he, his illness made him really ill at the moment and it's just too stressful for him. And the player would sign off on that because he, he'd be worried about not getting paid the six months of money he was owed or whatever. That's the world that we fucking live in. And I just think this contributes towards something. Like, this is why I said that you put the fucking cart before the horse here at ESL. Like, completely on this issue. We needed a fucking player union first. We need player protections first before we can even think about doing anything vaguely intrusive like drugs testing. It, it just it blows my mind. And to your point, actually, uh, about the fucking uh, Adder Adderall being the one thing that they really wanted to clamp down on. Apparently, I've talked to American people about this. I've got no frame of reference, but apparently it's really easy to get a prescription for anyway. So they always say, yeah. Uh... Yeah, apparently it's really easy. So, and I, 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 what, what if you take medical marijuana? They haven't even clarified that point. We're going we're gonna to make a big song and dance about marijuana being uh, on the band list. So much it gets its own separate heading because we're all stoners in Gamerland. But we're not going to say, what about medical marijuana? Will that get you an exemption? Would that not get you an exemption? So that, that point needed to be clarified as well. But apparently it's super easy to get a fucking script for Adderall. Because in America, they, they're pretty prescription happy. It's that type of culture. I think we all know that they're a, a nation of pharmaceuticals, uh, pharmaceutical users. 
So I, I, I think this is, again, so ridiculous because, as you rightly point out, if Adderall was the problem, that's the one drug that's got a get-out clause. And everything else that wasn't a problem is now a problem. Like Plus, imagine... Me? Okay, so you know what ESWC, that Chinese team qualified, Kui Yu, they were called. Yeah, yeah. So imagine this team qualifies for the major somehow. I'm not sure if they went to that like Malaysia qualifier, the one that Immunity and all those guys went through. Let's imagine somehow they go to one of these qualifiers and they get into the next major. And they come over here, but they don't know all these rules and they maybe haven't even been able to read of them. Maybe they haven't even heard of them. Maybe they're not even aware these rules exist. One of them comes over and literally does have something super innocuous, like a type of cold medicine that isn't actually on this, like you're not allowed to use on this list, but he has no way of knowing. And it's his is in fucking Chinese anyway. So maybe the name's different. Because remember, pharmaceutical names are different from country to country as they brand them. And he comes to the major and he just plays and gets banned on site. They can't get an extra player because they're at the major already. It, you know, he hasn't declared it. The first game started. They're out of the major. Imagine what a fucking PR nightmare that's going to be. Yeah, and just how it's going to just fuck with a guy for no reason. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it I, I just see like so too many, many potholes in this. You yeah, know? too many things can go yeah. wrong. Ha, <laughs> potholes. Hey, no, it, it's fucking. It is. It's 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 ridiculous. It's a serious issue. Um, it's something that I, you know, I oh, look, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't have minded if there was a problem. If there was a problem. Right, I agree. In principle, we should all be competing on a level playing field, right? But we haven't even established what drugs are performance enhancing, uh, which, which ones aren't, which ones work for our thing. You can't just adopt. If, if, if we all know that esports and sports are different, then why are we just taking things from sports and saying, fuck, we're going to use that now? It, that, that, that's completely illogical and ridiculous and, and contrary to everything we've done in esports for like the last 10 fucking years. Right, we're trying to carve out our own niche. We we had to get our own means of broadcasting to be truly successful. Because we couldn't crack TV. So we thought, fuck it, we'll 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 reinvent the fucking uh, wheel. And we did, and it was successful. And now TV are coming to us and saying, Oh, can we do your thing? That's what esports is ha having to do. It's gotta be the little engine that could, you know? Every fucking time. So I don't know why we're taking that on board. Anyway, but here's the thing. They're just they, they only put this in place because of the headlines, because it went mainstream, because it got picked up by the New York Times. Because if you're an industry leader and you get to say, hi there, mainstream media, you wrote about a problem, we fixed that problem, you get the next set of headlines before the mainstream media fuck off again and don't come back to esports for another six months. And that's all it was. It was just a fucking, it was just an opportunity to get all that free press. That's the only reason we have this policy now. That's why this is gross, though, because here's yeah. the thing. If you're ESL, okay, we know, listen, we know that's why you're doing it. I even say, okay, on that grounds, fair play, you've won on that one. You won the PR war. But that's you're supposed to be using those tactics for the outside world who actually believe your bullshit. Don't shit a shitter. Like, when we see this, we're like, are you, are you fucking kidding me? Like, this, we don't, don't try and tell us this is good for us and think we're going to swallow it. It's not going to happen, is it? Yeah, yeah it, it's... It's so obvious what it is, and it just makes me fucking really sad that uh, there that people haven't made this point. That now we've right. got this extra layer of intrusive, egregious testing, another hoop for players to jump through. And it's put it this it, way. Yeah, I've got one point I just thought of as a final point, right yeah, here, yeah, which is in uh, MMA, which is another sport I've seen where they've cracked down really heavily on PEDs in the last few years. Because recently they made it so you couldn't even use. Uh, testosterone replacement even if it was actually legally required because unfortunately a lot of people who require it now are people who did abuse t steroids in the past you know so it was sort of a loophole that they closed when that happened there was a massive sort of backlash uh no not backlash sort of like speaking out of people in mma who claim that they don't use drugs who were like good i'm glad this has happened and you know what i'm glad that that guy's got banned because i always thought he cheated there was tons of people basically almost everyone who presumably was clean, was sort of like, great, this needed to happen all the time. I'm glad this is a move forwards. Where are all those people in esports right now? Where are all the crowd strike pros who were like, I don't use drugs, so this is excellent. I think this is a great move forwards. I'm really glad they're cracking down. I'm, pros in CS, compared to every other game I'm aware of, are able to say whatever the fuck they want. They even say stuff against their own teams sometimes. Where are all the pros giving their opinion? No one. I can't see anyone who's given a good... I haven't even seen a single pro player who's like, great, this is excellent, that we've got rid of drugs and that. I haven't seen one. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's, the, that's the sad reality. Again, 
they're, they're without a player union and players being underrepresented uh, just as a whole in the industry, being completely fucked by the power structure that's in place, you're not going to see them do it for all the reasons you just talked about. You know, they don't have that job security. Like, the way it could easily work, this is completely conceivable. Let's say a player just got, comes out and says, well, fuck it, man. I'm fucking Nate Dog without the strokes. YOLO, baby. I smoke fucking weed every day. Fuck ESL. I don't even care. I don't want to play in, that, in those tournaments. Uh, you're not taking away my weed, right? No problem, right? That gets put up on Twitter. I mean, you know, fit it in 140 characters. Then fucking ESL noticed that. And, they, uh, they, and they're like, oh, all right, then. The organization he works for notice it. And they're like, what the fuck are you doing? We're invited to the CSL tournament. Uh, now, fuck it. I'm a player. I don't want to play in that tournament. I don't want to acquiesce to something I think is completely necessary. I don't, I don't, I, unnecessary. I don't want to do that. And so ESL go, well, look, mate, your player, go to the organization, your player is fucking out of line. He's making us look bad. So we're not going to invite you to the next tournament. Simple as that. You're on a shit list now, right? And the organization are like, no, 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 don't worry about that, right? But we'll sort this out. You're deleting that tweet, you're getting fine. Now, fuck off, I'm not. Right, you're out the team. Bye. So no, no one's going to no one's gonna fucking speak up. Because literally, the, the people that hold the fucking strings in place, to, you know, that you have to fucking dance to, you know, to, to get paid, they're the ones that are going to fucking shit on you so unbelievably hard if you upset this idea that esports is real and progressive and we're just like a real sport now because we've got drugs testing and everyone needs to get on board with this. If you're anti-drugs testing in esports, you're fucked in the head. I mean, I wrote an article about it saying just take all this with a pinch of salt. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. And immediately the, the, the overall feeling on that, like about 70-30 was, that's ridiculous. That's such a regressive attitude to have. We need drugs testing. Why should pro players be allowed to take drugs? Yeah. Why? Why can't we just intrude into their personal lives and just fuck with them all the time? That's what the community are thinking. So the community are behind it. That's the worst part as well. It, it, it's, it's a glorious con job because the people that need it to be convinced, the people that need to give it the buy-in, they've been sold on it. And everyone else with a fucking drop of common sense sees that this is just fucking unnecessary overreach. And that there was there was way bigger issues we needed to fix before this. So yeah, fucking really disappointed it's in place. Uh, and I, I I just hope that like you said, all the scenarios we've envisioned here that could happen, I just hope none of them do, because uh, that would be. Hideous. It doesn't seem like it's possible though, does it? It seems like one of them eventually is going to have to happen and fuck someone who did no drugs whatsoever. Yeah, some, something's something's going to happen. Um, I, I don't know what it's going to be. But yeah, I, I, I think something's, something is going to come out of it. It could even just be something like not as over the top maybe as some of the apocalyptic scenarios I've envisioned. It could be just something like, I don't know, one player comes out and like, rats out another player. Like he sees them having a sly joint or something like, and then fucks them over and it all comes out that he fucked them over and, you know. Oh, by the would, way, if... This obviously isn't something that any anyone can actually stop. So I wouldn't blame ESL if this happened in theory. But if if you were really if you were actually a, a player, okay, a really good pro player who's also literally a psychopath, like you don't care about people, here's all you do. Like night before you play in someone, everyone's at the bar having a quick drink. You just slot, dro drop a little something in their drink. Not a drug, by the way, just like one of the pain, the cold medicines that you're not allowed to have. So it wouldn't even much, have much of a difference. They drink the drink. They don't, nothing happens to them. You don't take them off and bomb them or anything. They just next day go in and they fail the test and then you won the match. There you go. Yeah, yeah. That could actually I mean, happen don't, now. Don't, don't get me wrong. We're, we're getting into fucking crazy territory no, that, anyway. That was, I, I purposely picked that as a ridiculous one, but that's, no, you could but, do that. Yeah, you could, mate, but we're, we're fucking... It would be gangsters, it, fuck, though, if you did. Yeah, it, would, it would be, it would be. It would be yeah, straight house ball. of cards type shit. Yeah. <laughs> mate, there's some underwoods in fucking esports. They're just not quite as clever. but Just as devious, but not as smart. Anyway... Well, that's my problem. There's not enough at ESL, mate. If they were, like, evil, but they were also, like, really like cunning and charming, I'd love it, you know. Instead, these are just, like, blundering people. Like, oh, I f did I fuck up again? Oh, well, I'll give it another go then. Just stop. Just stop. So... <laughs> Uh, I, I think on that note, we'll, we'll, we'll end the show there. Uh, apologies, it's a little bit shorter than some of the other shows we've done uh, with the technical problems as well. 
uh, obviously hasn't probably made for a great experience. And for that, I apologize. And I must indeed apologize to our fiscal overlords, Alpha Draft, that have come to expect a very high standard from us, not just in terms of the product we put out, but also the drama. I don't even know if this is going to generate any drama this week, Duncan, which caused... I mean, we did our best to beat that old dead ESL horse that we drag out every now and then, but... Yeah, just, I yeah, think we need to get some much. new material. Maybe the dog should start barking about something else, mate. Maybe that's what we need to do. Um, but yes, yeah, so obviously thanks to Alpha Draft for enabling us to put on this show uh, by paying us uh, ridiculous fistfuls of cash that we don't even deserve. Uh, so thanks to them for that. And indeed, you can show your appreciation for this content by going to Alpha Draft registering an account and placing a few, uh, you know, fantasy related competition style bets of your own. And uh, you should definitely do that. Uh, anyway, from me, Richard Lewis, from Duncan, uh, we're going to wish you a good night wherever you are. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. And until then, may all your drafts be alpha. Peace.